Another area is for those of you who are using data guard for disaster recovery, the interplay between multi-tenant and data guard, especially during the migration process is something that you really have to pay attention to. The main message is that it is possible to preserve your standby when you're migrating from non-CDB to PDB, but that it doesn't happen all by itself magically as part of the process. You do have to pay attention to this, and there are some manual steps that you're going to have to take care of. You don't have to rebuild your standby, so I want to make that clear. We can reuse data files, for example, but you may find that rebuilding the standby is actually your easiest option. So depending on the situation and whether you're moving to new hardware, for example, you might want to consider just rebuilding the standby. So we'll talk about all these different options. If you do have a, a CDB already that has a standby with, say, other pluggable databases in it, just be aware that you really do need to follow these guidelines if you're going to plug other PDBs into that container database, because otherwise what could happen is your managed recovery process will stop and your, your standby will no longer be in sync until you get your environment back in shape. Okay, so now let's talk about preserving the standby database and what we're, this is kind of related to the no copy and copy of files. So let's talk about reusing the data files, which in the benefit to doing this, when you're going non-CDB to PDB, we reuse the data files. Like I told you before about using the no copy or move options, your PDB will immediately be protected in your data guard environment. So here's the initial setup. Let's just say you have a 12102 non-CDB. You've got maximum protection and you've got a pretty good geographic distance there so that if anything happens in one location, the other location is okay. Well, for auto upgrade, we can upgrade your data guard environment again with one command. And what would happen is you would, uh, you would get downtime on your production system. You would upgrade that with auto upgrade and then your standby once it's opened in the Oracle home, will be implicitly upgraded by the redo apply from your primary. Because what will happen is all of those upgrade actions that took place with auto upgrade are going to be contained in the redo that gets shipped to your standby. So it will now be a block identical copy of your 19C database. Now that's all non-CDB. So how does this play in the move to a CDB in a data guard environment? Well, what you would do in this case is you start with that 19C non-CDB, and now you have your 19C container databases already set up with a standby on the same system. That's very important because standbys want the same directory structure and locations on the primary and standby. So you need that created in advance. Then what we need to do is make sure, make absolutely sure that your production and standby uh, non-CDBs are at the exact same SCN. And there's a hidden slide in the deck when you download it with all the ways that you can do that to make sure that they're exactly synchronized, not off at all. Then you do your usual set read only, create your XML manifest file, and a separate step if you're in ASM. On the standby, you need to create what is called an ASM alias list. Now, why do you need to do that? Well, remember when I talked about Oracle managed files before and how in Oracle managed files, the file name isn't really the file name, it's what you see as a file name, but then there's a, an alphanumeric identifier on the end of it. Well, in this case, with a primary and standby, those alphanumeric identifiers are gonna be different on the primary and standby ASM instances. So that ASM alias list is gonna be needed when we then do the create pluggable database command. Because what will happen then is that create pluggable database command gets replicated over the redo apply, but it's only create pluggable database. What has to happen is now your standby has to be able to find those files. And that's where that A ASM alias list comes in and says, oh, okay, here's the user table space and here's the alias on my standby. I plug that in as the user table space on the standby. So that's the steps involved in preserving your data files and plugging in as a standby. You can then uh, convert to non-CDB to PDB afterwards, and all of those uh, commands that are in non-CDB to PDB, including the recompilation and everything, that all those effects would be uh, shipped 
uh, as part of the redo stream normal as it normally would take place in data guard so once you're done there plugins completed you can enable your data guard broker start your application and you're on your way so if you want references to this, I know that that was kind of high level. I didn't go through step by step of how to preserve the data files. We have a lot of detail for you. Peter Van Poenbroek, who's the lead uh, product manager for DataGuard, has a nice blog post about how to do this. The MAA team, Max, Maximum Availability Architecture, has their usual detailed treatment of it in a support note. And then uh, Daniel has a blog post on troubleshooting this environment. One last bit I want to mention, about this when you're creating a, a PDB in a standby environment is that temp file management in DataGuard, uh, temp files that get added after the standby is created are not handled automatically. So when you have temp files in the PDB, you would need to add those yourself. And there's, a, again, a MOS note reference to that. 